All right, this morning, if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And what I'm going to emphasize today, number one, is that Jesus Christ really did die on the cross. Now you might ask me, is there anyone who denies that? Religiously speaking, in the Koran, which is, so to speak, the Bible of the Muslims, in the Koran, it is denied that Jesus Christ actually died on the cross. Now, if you think I'm mistaken about that, you can read in the Surah, chapter 4, verses 156 to 162. And surah in that printing is simply a chapter. But in the Quran, surah 4, verses 156 to 162, it is denied by Muslim doctrine that Jesus Christ actually died. Now, I want to say that he actually died. And he actually rose from the dead in the same body in which he had been crucified. Now, religiously speaking, Jehovah's Witnesses deny that. They believe Jesus Christ died. But he did not rise from the dead in the same body in which he was crucified. And as a matter of fact, in their theology, the man Jesus is dead forever. There is no more Jesus. Now you might say, I've never heard of anything like that. Charles Taze Russell and Jehovah's Witnesses are often referred to as Russellites because their ecclesiastical father was Charles Taze Russell. And in his early writings, here's just an excerpt of what he said, quote, The man Jesus is dead, forever dead. Our Lord's human body did not decay or corrupt, whether it was dissolved into gases or is still preserved somewhere, no one knows. Unquote. Jehovah's Witnesses believe before Jesus Christ came to the earth manifest in flesh, he existed as a spirit creature in heaven and was Michael the archangel. But then when he came to earth, he ceased to be a spirit creature and became wholly mortal and died. But since he offered himself in death, he could not be resurrected because he would take back what he offered. Therefore, the man Jesus is dead forever. And in ascension... He now is in heaven and once again is Michael the archangel. But there is no more Jesus. Gone forever. Whether his body was dissolved into gases or eaten by wild animals or is preserved somewhere, no one really knows. But two things I want to just 
talk a little bit about today. Number one, he really did die. Contrary to what the Quran says. And number two, he really did rise again in the same body in which he had been crucified. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, <clears throat> I would like to read verses 3, 4, and part of 5. Now we could go on and read, but those two verses and a part of the third will give us the information that we're looking for. Paul is a writer. He's writing to the church at Corinth. And here in this section of scripture, he is summarizing in the present what he had previously preached to these people in the past. If you will notice how he begins in verse 1, he said, I declare present tense unto you the gospel which I preached unto you past tense. So he is currently summarizing in the present what he had previously preached to them. He says in verse 3, <clears throat> For I delivered unto you First of all, first of all being the pri priority of this message, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen. Now, I'm not so sure how critical you are in what you read, but having read these verses, I want to call your attention to the fact that in these verses we have two declarations and each declaration is followed by a supporting piece of evidence. Now one declaration was Christ died. And the supporting piece of evidence that he actually did was and that he was buried. So you have a declaration. He died. A supporting piece of evidence and was buried. Now the second declaration was he rose again the third day. And the supporting piece of evidence that followed was that he was seen. And we could go on and read all of those listed in this chapter as eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Now these two declarations, along with the supporting evidence, now can you see what I'm saying? Two declarations, two supporting pieces of evidence. Christ died. What's the evidence? He was buried. He rose again. What's the evidence? He was seen after he was put to death and buried. Two declarations, two pieces of supporting evidence. Now, these two declarations along with the supporting evidence, are the central and most important teachings of Christianity. They emphasize both the forgiveness of sins and the assurance of an afterlife in which we, we retain our identity just as Jesus Christ 
did. These two statements deal with the forgiveness of sins and the assurance of an afterlife in which we retain our identity just as Jesus Christ did. Now, let's look at this for just a few minutes. In the phrase, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, if we just take that phrase there, we have stated three things. Number one, the fact. And the fact is, Christ died. The Koran said he didn't. And that's tragic. Because I have read from several sources that there are reported 1.8 billion, billion Muslims in the world today. But God's word says Christ died. Then we have stated the purpose for our sins. And then we have stated that that information agrees with what the Old Testament predicted would happen. Thus, it transacted or transpired according to the scriptures. So we have the fact Christ died, the purpose for our sins, and this agreed with the Old Testament prophecies being according to the scriptures. Now, I'm not even going to give you all of the information, but just a little bit of it. He actually died. First of all, I might just state that a crown of thorns, you ever get a sticker in your foot or your finger? Huh? A crown of thorns was pushed onto his skull, after which he suffered five major wounds causing a heavy loss of blood. Four of these were caused by nails used to fix him to the cross. I have information that in remains that have been found of Palestinian crucifixion, the nails were five to seven inches long and about three-eighths of an inch in diameter. A crown of thorns, four nails, five to seven inches long, three-eighths of an inch in diameter. His side was then pierced with a spear. The professional Roman executioners declared him dead without breaking his legs. When Pilate was assured of his death, he released the body of Jesus for burial. The body was taken down from the cross, embalmed in some 75 to 100 pounds of spices and bandages, and laid in a garden tomb sealed with a great rock and guarded by Roman soldiers for three days and three nights. Even if he wasn't dead and somehow revived in the tomb, he could not have unwrapped himself, rolled a stone away estimated in weight by some to be 1,500 pounds, overcome the Roman soldiers and escape unnoticed. Thus, he died and the supporting evidence was he was buried. 
he was buried. But he didn't stay buried because he rose again the third day as the Old Testament predicted and the supporting evidence was is that he was seen by multiple people. Now when I say that that transacted according to the scriptures, are you familiar with any of those scriptures? Turn to Psalm chapter 16. Psalm chapter 16. And I'll take the time to read this with you because I'd like for you to see it. <clears throat> but in Psalm 16, reading from verse 8, it says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or Sheol as the word is. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now if you will turn to the second chapter of the book of Acts. We have in this chapter a lengthy sermon that was preached by Peter to a class of Jews on the day of Pentecost. And as a part of Peter's sermon, here's what the inspired man of God said, Acts 2 verse 25. Notice, for David speaketh concerning who? Him. David speaketh concerning him. And therefore here, Peter applies the words of David to a specific subject. David speaketh concerning him, quote, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad, moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because I will not suffer, that will not leave my soul in hell, or Hades as the word is here, neither will I suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now if you go on and read this particular sermon, you will find that Peter applies the words of David to Jesus Christ. My flesh shall rest in hope. You will not suffer your holy one to see corruption. Corruption would relate to a body. But why? Because Jesus Christ would be raised from the dead. Now, if you will turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And it's because of scriptures just like we read. That you read Paul on one of his missionary journeys. Chapter 17 verse 1. Have it said of him. Now, when they had passed through Apostles. Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of what? The Scriptures. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preached unto you is Christ. Where did that message come from? The Scriptures the Old Testament prophecies. So when Paul to the Corinthians said, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now let me tell you something. He died, was buried, and rose again. Now, you may not know this, but I'm going to say it because when you read those two verses as testified by scholars who majored in the language, here's what they say. Died 
and was buried is a tense in the Greek language that lays stress simply upon past facts. In other words, Christ died in the past. He was buried in the past. But when you get to rose again, the verb tense changes. It changes. It changes to the perfect tense, which lays stress not on past facts, as with died and was buried, but it lays stress on the abiding results of the resurrection. In other words, Jesus Christ not only rose again, but guess what? He's still alive. He's still alive. And guess what? He'll always be alive. This is why you read Revelation 1 verse 18, Him speaking, I am He that liveth and was dead, and behold, am alive forevermore. But you can't read the evidence of the nails and the thorns and the spear and, and every bit of that and the body taken down and embalmed and put in a sepulcher and guarded with a Roman's. You, you can't put all that together and believe that somehow he revived and slipped out of that tomb unnoticed. He actually died. But on resurrection ground, he was seen. Seen in the same body in which he was crucified. Now, I'm not going to go through all of those appearances, but there were two disciples on the road to Emmaus. 24th chapter of Luke. And Jesus was walking along with them. But as that conversation develops, you know what they realized? This one, who, this one whom they were seeing, this one whom they were hearing, this one with whom they did eat was none other than Jesus Christ after he'd been crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. Eleven disciples. Judas, gone. Thomas was then present, but with 11 disciples, Thomas present, those disciples saw him, they heard him, and they were asked to touch the scars of crucifixion. He was in the same body in which he had been crucified. And you can just read multiple times of the cases where he was actually seen by someone after he died and was buried. Boy, I'll tell you something. Just don't minimize the fact he actually did die. What's the proof? He was buried. But after that, three days later, When the stone was rolled away, Jesus didn't come out. He was already gone. And when the stone was rolled away, it was stated, he is not here. He's risen. He's risen. He's risen. But yet Charles Taze Russell would say the man Jesus is dead forever. But the Bible that I have says he rose again. And after 40 days and 40 nights, he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And ever lives to make intercession. Gone forever dead. Not the Bible I read. Not the Bible I read. Now I want you to just think about this. Christ died. What was the reason? For our sins. 
the little preposition for is from a Greek word that means on behalf of. His death was on our behalf. Christ died for our sins. You might remember that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. And wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and death passed upon all men. Speaking of humanity, for all have sinned, Romans 5, verse 12. Now if the wages of sin is death, and all have sinned, then death passed upon all. But Christ didn't die because of sins. He didn't have any. His death was for our sins. This is why the Bible said he did no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. 1 Peter 2, verse 22 and 24. Thank God for that. He died for our sins. And that death paid the penalty of sin. Let me tell you something. The payment is offered as a free gift. All you have to do is receive it. You know how you receive it? By faith in Jesus Christ. You understand what he did, who he was, that he was qualified to do what he did. And what he did satisfied the just demands of a holy God. And on the basis of justice satisfied, God can be merciful to sinners. Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again and is still alive and will always be alive and someday he's coming again. Amen. He's coming again. And even though we may depart this life in physical death, that death will not be a final claim on God's children because the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And I'll guarantee you what that 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is about is not only about the penalty of sin being paid for, but it's about an afterlife where we retain our identity. That's something to think about. Now, if we retain our identity, I say that because Jesus did. And we shall be like him, for we'll see him as he is. But if he retained his identity, can you just look about at your family members? Will they be there on the other side? How about your friends? Will they be there on the other side? We should do everything we can to share the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. The gospel is glad tidings. Good news. And you know what's good news? The debt has been paid. It's been paid. And it wasn't paid just as an afterthought before everything began. Jesus Christ stood slain as a lamb from the foundation of the world. And God foresaw the way things would play out, but he made provision for fallen creatures. He made provision that they might be saved. I would simply say an invitation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know where that statement is found? 
there was a Philippian jailer who had the care of Paul and Silas while in prison. And that jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, if I had no other light on the subject but just that question, and I turned to all of the literature that you can find in this world today, you would think the answer to that question was the most difficult thing you would ever consider. But you know what the answer was to that question? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Do you know him to whom to know is life eternal? And I want to say to all of you who know the Lord, I've enjoyed our life together. Thank God for it. But when it ends, I'll see you on the other side. Amen. May we stand. As we prepare to sing our song, 252, just take time in your own heart to be sure that you have reached a time in your life where you understood that you were a sinner, having inherited a sin nature from Adam, and yet the penalty of sin was paid for in one who was qualified to pay it. You see, I can't die for you because I'm a sinner like you. But the one who died for me and for you was without sin, a perfect substitute. Let's sing, Brother Buddy. Come, every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the law, and he will surely give rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Boy, those are words when you leave here today and you're driving down the road going to wherever you may be going, always remember, He will save you, N-O-W, now, now. But one day, now will run out. It'll run out for you and for me. But while you have light, believe in the light that you may be children of light. And the one who said that was our Lord. And in the same context, he said, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. See the light and believe in the light that you may be children of light. Let's sing one more verse, brother buddy. Oh, His precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crown and blood that washes white as snow. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, 
He will save. He will save you now. Just remember, Easter is not about the bunny. It's about the lamb. All right. Brother Miguel, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Amen. Amen.